Thanksgiving Day 1990, and we got into a, just a horrible storm, worse than any nightmare I'd ever had of going to sea. The sea height officially was 65 feet, uh, and we had 85 knots of wind. The boat was uh, capsized, we turned it upside down 400 miles west of Cape Horn set off an emergency beacon, didn't know if it was operating or not, and just waited. Uh, about an hour and a half after the capsize, we were upside down in the trimaran with about knee-deep water on the ceiling. Another wave came along and picked the boat up and just threw it. And uh, we were rewrited. The mast was shattered. The boat was filled with water after that. And we were able to find some refuge up in the forward sail locker. It was behind a watertight bulkhead. Um, it did have four feet of water in it, but we pumped that out. My mother and sisters had gathered in Cambridge, Massachusetts for Thanksgiving Day. And we were scheduled to call in uh, through the ham radio. And we didn't, they knew we were in a storm, and so my mother ended up driving home, um, not knowing what our situation was, and there were three messages on our answering machine. The first was Lieutenant Cranzine, Coast Guard New York, can you confirm that a distress signal from Great American is real? Uh, the second was from Scott Air Force Base in the Midwest, asking the same question. And the third was from uh, one of my sailing mentors from uh, Rhode Island. He said, this is Wilson, this is Philip, please call me right away. And in the middle of the night, 17 hours later, I heard a new sound enter the cacophony outside, and it was low and uniform. So I popped up through the hatch and looked, and I saw a single light of a ship, and uh, I could read on the side of it, New Zealand Pacific. Obviously, the ship was there to find us. I had known from previous studies of trade routes of the world, there's only one ship along that route from Australia and New Zealand around Cape Horn per week. And so we were obviously incredibly lucky that that ship uh, was, was uh, upwind of us and was able to find us. The ship was 815 feet long. It was the largest refrigerated uh, container ship in the world. You know, if you took the John Hancock Tower in Boston and laid it down on its side, the ship was bigger than that. And that's what they were able to maneuver and put alongside us. It was incredible. Our boat's going up and down in the seas. Um, the ship is rolling through 60 degrees itself. And, uh, we had that one chance that you see in the movies to jump for a rope ladder hanging down from the side of the ship. Um, and we were able to get on board the ship that way. We called into the sisters. One of my nephews drove up to Marblehead to be there with her and uh, through the night and there was no there was no news and then when we got on board the ship <laughs> finally it was about three o'clock in the morning and Cape Horn's on the same time zone as Massachusetts so now I was faced with whether I should call home and maybe startle or scare my mother wake her out of sleep or if they had some inkling that there was something wrong uh, she could have some relief from that and know that we we're okay so I did call, and <laughs> she answered the phone and said, hello? And I said, hi, Mom. And she said, Richie, where are you? <laughs> I said, well, I'm on a ship. And then you could just hear this huge sigh of relief. She said, no, it was something else obviously that happened. And that's a great story. Yeah, 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 yeah. Many years ago, I was a school teacher in the Boston Public Schools, and what I learned was that when I brought in real-world problem sets into my mathematics classes, that the kids paid much more attention. Um, and so later on, when um, I 
was exposed to uh, science programs in the field and I could see how engaged those students were. I thought, well, we can't send the, the middle school students to the rainforest or to sea, but perhaps we could connect the sea to the middle school students and we could bring, therefore, live science, live geography, you know, live physics problems and so forth into the classrooms in a very orchestrated way. The mission of Sites Alive is to excite and engage students in learning. When we began Sites Alive, uh, we started with something that I knew something about, which was sailing, and uh, we started with a long sailing voyage, which was from San Francisco to Boston around Cape Horn. And the idea there was that it would be a long enough voyage to be able to get all sorts of school topics in. It would have some drama with Cape Horn, of course, um, and that would excite kids. And we would have some history in it as well because we were trying to break a clipper ship era sailing record. Um, I was quite early online, and uh, so originally we did it with CompuServe in 1990 for the capsized voyage. We had a couple of Q&A going back and forth. But in 1993, we found a much better source, which was one of the proprietary online services named Prodigy, which was the biggest one at the time. It was the only one that could do any kind of graphics at all. And so we approached WGBH in Boston that had a program called Nova, and they were doing some of their Nova TV programs, but doing an online version. And uh, we were there, therefore able to get connected into Prodigy, and they followed us. It was called Ocean Challenge Live. And at the end, we asked them how successful it had been, and they said, well, we have two million members, 10% of our members were following regularly, uh, 100,000 adults, 100,000 kids. And this was just spectacular. We were getting 200 questions a day from um, the, their audience uh, about all sorts of things going on at sea. And that, as much as anything, proved the concept of live interactive learning adventures. Since then, we've done 75 interactive, full semester long, three month long programs from all over the world. As a sailor, I knew about a race called the Vendée Globe, and I'd never had any interest whatsoever in racing this race. It's too hard, it's too long, it's too dangerous, the boats are too far from land for help, and yet it might provide an opportunity to create a truly global school program because the course of this race is around the world, single-handed, non-stop. It leaves from France, it goes south through the Atlantic, you turn east past South Africa, you go across the Indian Ocean, you go south of New Zealand, you go across the Pacific Ocean, around Cape Horn, back up through the Atlantic to finish in France. And so this uniquely global event, there's no other sports event that goes around the world, um, with drama, um, usually half the fleet doesn't finish the race um, for reasons of breakdowns or loss of vessels. Um, they've lost the two skippers along the way as well. Um, the drama of the event will engage the, the school kids. Oceans had become finally an acceptable topic of interest that perhaps we could build this as a live ocean expedition. We were not going to be saying this is a French yacht race. This was going to be a live ocean expedition and we could get uh, students from other countries involved. And if you could get a conversation from a student in Beijing, talking to a student in Bogota, talking to a student in Boston, well, that would be really interesting. And you could use this unique global event as a unique unifying school program and excite kids along the way, get them to learn, get them to be exposed to other students around the world as well. That was the goal of sailing the Vendée Globe. In 2008-2009 race, uh, we started in the Bay of Biscay in November. The race had a huge storm and it really decimated the fleet. Of the 30 boats, nine boats had to go back and uh, four of those boats were damaged so severely that they were not able to resume the race. Three of those four boats were brand new boats built specifically for that race. We got through that storm, or the boat did, got through okay. I did not. I got thrown across the cabin and ended up breaking one or two ribs. It was because I let go for one instant and the boat hit a wave right then 
knocked the whole boat sideways. I got thrown. The rib takes about uh, a month to heal. Um, over the course of the next three weeks, really getting down into the South Atlantic, it was extremely painful. In the beginning, I couldn't get into the bunk on the boat because it, the configuration of the boat required some contortions. It wasn't until I got into the Indian Ocean that I actually was able to climb into the bunk. When I finally was able to get into the sleeping bag, I had a couple of <laughs> good sleeps in the Indian Ocean through all these gales, the worst part of it all. Um, when I'd sleep, uh, I think I slept for two hours one time, which was just <laughs> what you can't imagine. The Vendée Globe is raced in a, in a class of boats called an Open 60. Um, they are 60 feet long, 6 foot bow sprit, normally about 18 feet wide, uh, 90 foot mast. They will surf down the seas. Um, the boats have hit up over 30 knots, which is um, more than I ever want to see. I've never seen that. Um, I've seen in the 20s, and that's quite enough. If you remember when the America's Cup used to be sailed in Newport, the boats have a similar sail plan, but you don't have the extra 10 guys on the boat. <laughs> and you don't come, on, come in for a launch either. <laughs> when we first decided to enter this race um, and to try to create the Global School Program, I can tell you that in the back of my mind, one of my, my great fears was always, what happens if I have to climb the mast and make a repair alone at sea in the south. There are stories of, of sailors in this race going aloft and just getting creamed because different from a mountain climber going up ropes where the rope is fixed, it's fixed. And where our rope is fixed is waving around in the sky. So uh, I went along through the race and it got all the way up towards Cape Horn, across the deep south, which is the worst part of this. And then there came an occasion where there was something broken aloft that I either had to never make a mistake for the last 8,000 miles of the race back to France, or I could go aloft and try to fix the problem. And I was able to do it, um, uh, make the repair, come back down, and I can tell you that I was completely exhausted at, at the end of that. A huge amount of stress. The first two gales we had, of seven gales, were um, hurricane force. And so when those are coming along, you watch them coming along on the weather maps and you know you're just going to get hammered and there's nothing you can do about it. You can maybe modify where you are so that you'll be um, perhaps on the proper side of a weather system, but uh, that's really the best you're going to be able to do. And you don't know whether you're going to come out of it, you don't know what's going to happen. You're just waiting for something to go wrong on the boat. Racing an Open 60 single-handed is like having a premium cable subscription where all of the channels are on one monitor and they're all going at the same time. There's the weather channel, there's the food channel, there's the motorcycle repair shop guys, there's history, everything is going on at once. It's absolute multiple channels going all full on all the time and you're, you're repairing things. Okay, we've got to make some fresh water with the desalinator. We've got to make a sail change. We've got to get the next weather map. We've got to repair that winch. We've got to go aloft. I've got to charge the batteries. Somewhere in there, I've got to sleep. It's just on and on and on and on. During the course of the race, I slept two times for four hours. That was straight. And those were both by mistake. Um, basically, I just conked out right on the keyboard at the chart table. So the sleep deprivation is really serious uh, because at that point it's accumulated. I've had hallucinations in the past, had one semi-hallucination this, this time as well, where I imagined that I had to download a 20-ton anchor through the satellite telephone to the boat. I don't know whether that idea came whether I was asleep or whether I was just waking up or sort of in a daydream or what. But the problem that, that I foresaw was not that you can't download the 20-ton anchor through the satellite telephone. It was that the, our high baud rate 
satellite telephone was malfunctioting, the 56K baud rate, and I would have to download this through the 2.4K baud rate Iridium satellite telephone. And this was just going to take forever. And I know I agonized about that for about 18 wide awake hours. So um, that was not in a dream. That was, I was agonizing how I was going to do this. And then just eventually just realized, no, you don't have to do that. Maybe I had a nap or something and it was enough to sort of set the record straight. At one point there coming up the Atlantic, it was just so hard and it was so long, it was upwind. We were connected in with Tufts Medical Center's emergency room here in Boston. And I called Dr. Barney Walden and said, okay, you're the emergency doc. You got me through you know, the broken ribs and you got me through the, the neck and the big eye gash. Now you've got to turn it into a shrink and help get me home. So he would call every couple of days and let me talk and, and uh, that's what I really needed. So when I came back from that race, uh, I was really physically, mentally, emotionally spent. I was at sea for 121 days, 17 weeks, 28,790 miles on the GPS at the end of the race. It's incredibly hard, it's incredibly tiring, but it is uh, everything that's embedded both in our teacher's guide and in curriculum standards at science, geography, math, we were delivering all of that. Um, that's what really made it meaningful to me. When I finished that race, uh, without trying to be dramatic about it, I thought that there was some chance I might never go sailing again. I was just done. Um, but over the course of time, I started to rethink that. And really the people that started to bring me back to that were the French public. And so they kept asking, Dumil Dues, Dumil Says, will you be back for 2012 or 2016? And I would originally respond with, uh, no, une fois par vie, one time per lifetime. I thought I needed a better answer than that, and so I started to think about what it would take, in fact, to, to come back and do it again. If there was any disappointment in actually finishing the 2008 Monday Globe, it was that we know we had interest from all over the world to publish our uh, K-12 series, but we just ran out of time to be able to pull that all together. So we're starting early now, uh, two and a half years ahead of time. We have the boat, we're sitting on it right now. The goals are to create global programs for K-12, which is what we've done for 20 years with Sites Alive, for asthma, for that constituency, because I have had asthma since I was a one-year-old kid, um, severe asthma, and I take four drugs a day to manage that. And I know that when I was a kid, if I could have seen someone, anyone, doing something, anything who had asthma, that that would have been hugely useful to me to see that people could still do the things they wanted to try to do even though they had asthma. And the third uh, constituency now is seniors because I was the oldest skipper in the 2008 race at 58 and I will be 66 for the 2016 race and there's all sorts of things that we can use that sort of a race for with the seniors constituency to let them to, to, to say look turn off the TV get off the sofa you're not finished yet to teach about nutrition to teach about fitness to teach about um, sleep so all of those things together are the reasons to try to race this race in 2016. This is a solo race, but the skipper is just the tip of the iceberg as far as the team goes. And we have our Sites Alive team, which will be producing the outreach programs, but we also have our boat team, led by Joff Brown and Rachel Oliver, who are our boat and electronics gurus. They've done all of this before, and then the boat was refit up in Portland, Maine, at Maine Yacht Center with Brian Harris who's the only American who has dealt with these boats uh, over the course of the last decade and a half. Those folks have been helping us 
put this together because they get the point and uh, they want to make this not only a big national program but a global program as well. You're in the race, you have to race the race. You do the best for respect for yourself, for respect for your competitors. So that if they beat you, they know that they've beaten your best. So you keep charging along, going as fast as you can. But that's not the primary objective. We know from like the 2008 race that we were the only ones who were doing, within the competitors within the race, we were the only ones who were trying to do something like this. So oftentimes people say, well, how did you, how did you do that? And say, well, I spent about two hours a day working on our outreach programs. For all of our voyages, and the Vande Globe in particular, where you're so far from land and you're alone, that the connection I have to make those programs really work, um, the kids will help bring me home. And that's, that's the most important thing, really. We, would, we certainly wouldn't be doing this race if we didn't, for me, if we didn't have those outreach programs. That's really the objective. My girl just sailed straight into that mooring. It's like, must be not paying attention at all. <laughs> <laughs>